All right. Thank you for coming to this uh, morning session. Um, so today we're going to talk about generative AI and information discovery. And in a minute, we will have two interesting presentations. Uh, one on a new product from Elsevier, and another one on how Clemson University uses generative AI information discovery product. And my name is Leo Lo. I'm the dean of the College of University Libraries and Learning Sciences at the University of New Mexico. Now, even though I'm a dean of a library, when I was a freshman uh, in college many, many years ago, I went to the library orientation, and the librarian showed me how to use the card catalog, and that scared me away from the library until the internet happened. <laughs> so my point is, search has come a long way. Uh, and speaking of the internet, let me put... So maybe we can walk down the memory lane a little bit and see you know, the development of search or information discoveries. So if you think back to the early days of the internet, finding you know, um, information was more of a manual task. Remember Yahoo directory? It was like a, basically a giant organized list of websites. Simple, but it took a lot of work, and it couldn't keep up with you know, the, the growing web. And that was our first step in trying to organize the internet's kind of fast content. And then, as the internet grew, we needed a better way. So that entered um, search engines like uh, AutoVista and, of course, Google. Um, and Google was a game changer with its kind of page rank algorithm. It started ranking pages based on how many other sites are linked to them. And that was our big move to using, I would say, smart algorithms to sift through the web, making it a little bit easier to find what you're looking for. And then we got personal. Search engines began to tailor results just for you based on your previous searches, where you were, and what you clicked on. This made search results more relevant to each person. But it also started conversations about privacy and how our data is used. And then AI and machine learning took things to the next level. These technologies help search engines predict what we're going to, looking for and, getting, and it's getting smarter over time. Searching wasn't just about finding stuff. It was about understanding the intent behind the uh, query. And now, generative AI uh, is kind of at, the, at, the, kind of at the frontier of this revolution or evolution. It's generating information engaging in dialogue and providing responses that appear to display a grasp of content and context. Now, with generative AI, there are some pros and cons. Um, it, at its best, generative AI can make it easier for everyone to find information. Now you can just ask question in your own words, and it gets what you mean, and it gives you the answer. Because sometimes you just don't want to sift through you know, a list of websites, after websites to find out how, say, how to clean hot water spots off your windshield. And that's just a personal experience recently. <laughs> so think of AI as your personal assistant. It could learn what you like and how you ask questions, giving you answers that feel tailor-made. Um, for example, now GPT-4 allows you to give, you, give it uh, custom instructions like write in a certain way or, or consider my research interests. But then there are also a lot of limitations or cons. Accuracy and reliability, there are big major concerns. So generative AI can get things wrong. It can share outdated or incorrect information. It hallucinates. Also, sometimes there just isn't a correct answer to a question like how to clean you know, uh, hard water spots. So that means we need to, know, how, need to mo know more about these algorithms, how they come up with those answers. And this means you also need to be a little bit more critical about the answers we get. Which, by the way, I think is an opportunity for libraries to really push for information literacy in this age. 
Now, personalization also comes at the price. The data required to tailor responses raises significant privacy concerns. And the algorithm's opaque nature often leaves us unaware of how the information is being used or how results are being generated. And then there's another growing concern on how the ease of these generative AI could undermine traditional skills for students especially. Research skills, critical thinking skills, information literacy skills. So where does this help leave us? It's a new and fast changing technology. I do believe it will keep improving. Uh, is it ever going to be perfect? Probably not. Uh, the internet is not perfect, yet we're using it you know, well. Uh, the key is to keep exploring and experimenting with it and learn from it. Uh, and today, so we have these two pro interesting projects that they're doing just that. Uh, we have a case study of using Site at Clemson and the new product, Scopus AI from Elsevier. So let me invite Elias to the podium and share that project at Clemson. All right. Thanks, Leo, and buenos dias, morning. Uh, my name is Elias Tsok. I am the Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Research at Clemson University in South Carolina. Over the next few minutes, I will share with you some updates about our subscription of site, also known as the ChatGPT for Research. Um, before I go to the next slide, I wanted to take a moment and say thanks to our Dean, Chris Cox, who's in the room, um, for supporting and encouraging us to be proactive, um, to provide access to resources and tools that make sense for the students and faculty at Clemson. So let's start with a couple of questions regarding the power of Gen AI tools in the context of higher education. How can these tools and technologies help with the discovery and access of scientific information? And what makes the current situation a challenge? Well, it has to do with what some call information overload or information abundance. As we know, there has been an exponential growth of information over the last two, three decades in part because of the internet, but also the emergence of online databases and journals. Open access has also increased access to the, the literature. So all of this sounds good, except when we deal with a lot of information, it becomes increasingly difficult for researchers to stay up to date with the latest developments in their fields. The graphic on the slide illustrates the growth of scientific publications from science and engineering disciplines over the last 25 years. They publish more than 2.5 million articles annually. So the reality of a world with an exponential growth of scientific publications also leads us to other questions. What type of quantitative or Gen AI tools can help synthesize and make sense of the vast amount of information being produced? How do we know what to trust? Over the last few months, we have seen a growing number of Gen AI tools created specifically for higher education. We hear about the top three, the top five, the top 10 tools for higher education. This is where libraries can play a key role in working with vendors, campus groups, faculty and students to proactively assess and arrange for trials that will allow everyone to better understand the new tools and how they can help them with their teaching and research activities. We often get questions like, do you have a list or an inventory of tools that I can review and choose the best one for my class 
or for my research. We kind of had one, but it wasn't that comprehensive. So two weeks ago, when Ithaca SNR released their Gen AI, AI product tracker, we loved it, and we shared it with as many as we could. If you haven't seen it, check it out. So let's talk about some of the initiatives that we've done at Clemson. In the summer of 2023, we created an informal group that was interested in learning and researching about the potential benefits and limitations of AI tools for teaching and learning. In July, we started a one-month trial of site. After a successful month of trial, we recommended a one-year subscription. In order to um, help the campus community learn about the benefits of the new tool, we created a research guide for it, which explains what site is, how to create an account, and also a link to a feedback form, because we want to hear from the students and faculty. During the fall semester, we collaborated with other campus groups, the Office of Teaching Excellence, the Career Center, the Ethics Institute, and together on January 9th, on a rainy day, we hosted a conference focused on AI. Despite the rain, we had 180 plus participants. So we also co-authored a conference report for the provost office, which included some specific recommendations about next steps. So let's talk about SITE. In short, SITE is a smart citation index that displays the context of citations and classifies their intent using deep learning. So we all know that the number of citations for a publication is an important metric for research impact. However, just the total number of citations doesn't give the full picture. What if someone is citing a paper because they are questioning or contrasting the original finding? Also, the cite citation analysis gives the exact citation statement from the citing paper and indicates whether the citation was about mentioning, supporting, or contrasting. It also indicates the location of the citation in the citing paper. Was it in the introduction, methodology, results, discussion, or somewhere else? Cite is used by students and researchers from around the world. It was initially funded in part by the NSF and the NIH. In November of last year, it was acquired by Research Solutions. One of the most popular functionalities in Cite is their assistant feature, which works very similar to ChatGPT, with one main difference. Results are backed up by their database of smart citations, which includes more than 1.8 billion references, for which they have indexed more than 1.2 billion citation statements from full text articles. So when you type a question or prompt in site, you get a response back, and it includes a list of references. And if you hover over the references, you will see the contextual information about that specific paper, including the citation statement and a summary of the type of citations, supporting, mentioning, or contrasting. Also, in order to help users understand how and why it generates its response, along with the results, users have the option to view the search terms in the list of publications consulted to generate the response. So in short, Assistant allows users to ask and discover information that they can trust. A couple of other features of Site. On their homepage, they remind you of actions that you can take in order to take advantage of the full experience. So when I got the screenshot, I did not have installed the browser extension. So I got that reminder. 
and also I didn't have my profile completed. We have found that the custom dashboard option is super helpful. It allows you to create a report for a group of papers, but it also allows you to view site data in other contexts. For instance, you can view a report or a dashboard for a specific journal, for a funding agency, or for a specific institution. So let's talk about how students and faculty at Clemson are using the tool. As of, what, 10 days ago, March 15th, we had 473 active users. After the conference in January, we added 200 more. Out of the active users, 42% are undergraduates, 33% graduate students, and the rest are faculty and staff members. There is a diverse type of majors and departments using it. On the slide, we have listed the top five from each of these groups. Perhaps one of the limitations of SITE is that it is heavily focused on STEM disciplines. This is in part because every item in their database must have a DOI. And we know that there are many books and book chapters out there without DOIs. So those cannot be part of their um, database. A bit more about the user engagement um, with the tool. The assistant queries, again, that's the equivalent of a chat GPT query box, is the most heavily used feature. The number of queries have doubled during the first half of the spring semester which means that users are writing or customizing their queries. Report views have also doubled. These are full reports or dashboard for specific publications. So it's possible that faculty members or grad students are working on specific topics and they're creating dashboards for those topics. When it comes to research impact, this is an example of how site can provide a report on the output for an entire institution. So in this case, we know that out of the almost 56,000 publications from Clemson researchers, less than 1% are about contrasting the original findings, which I think is okay, or great. It also provides a summary of the editorial notices. So information about retractions, withdrawals, corrections, errata. The report can get quite extensive because it also includes list of authors and list of publications. So to conclude, um, some of the lessons learned. Getting faculty and students involved in trials and implementation stages it's very important. Proactively engage with others, campus partners and vendors, and learn about the benefits and limitations of the tools, it's also imperative. Check for discipline coverage and accessibility requirements. The site subscription was delayed by a month because of a accessibility issue that we found. And we're working with the site developers to fix that uh, over the next few months. And as with most new initiatives, it's important to document progress and engagement. But also, we need to continue to assess the value and impact of these new services. And with that, I think that's it. Emily. Thanks so much, Elias. That was fascinating. Um, I love how you're learning from your users and, and understanding how they're kind of inter interacting with the tool. Um, my name's Emily Singley. I'm the uh, Vice President of North American Library Relations at Elsevier. And I want to share with you today an update on some of the Gen AI, Gen AI work that we're 
doing, um, as well as talk a little bit about what we're learning from users of these emerging tools. So it was just a year ago, actually, at Spring CNI that my colleague, Judd Dunham, was here uh, talking to you all about what our ideas were, what we were thinking about in this space. Um, and uh, Judd is our uh, senior product manager for Science Direct. Um, and I love this quote. This is what he said on the CNI stage last year. Can we break what he called the three words, 10,000 papers paradigm? So. Uh, just like what uh, Elias was saying, you know, this has always been the, the problem, information overload, right? There's more and more and more articles and papers and books um, and just more and more information to sift through. And the tools we currently have, the traditional library databases, you have to input a keyword, right? A few words that match something in the database, hopefully, and you get back search results, right? We're all familiar with this. You get back lots and lots and lots of search results, some of which are relevant and some of which you kind of wonder, you know, how did that happen? Um, so it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time that scholars and students and researchers spend sifting through the scholarly literature. So can we do better? How can we do this differently? And how can Gen AI help? So these are some of the ideas we sort of started with a year ago um, to think about what does the future look like in this space? Um, so where are we now? It's a year later. Uh, and so we are here with Gen AI. Um, Scopus AI was the first one out of the gate for us, launched in January. It's in production now. Uh, some of you may have seen it or you might be exploring it. Um, and so this is an LLM uh, enhanced Scopus search tool. And um, we don't have the keyword paradigm anymore, right? It's natural language searching. Um, it's uh, using the, uh, we've all been becoming familiar with these terms now. It's built on the RAG fusion technology, so retrieval augmented generation, using vector search, some custom prompt engineering that we've developed in-house, and a large commercial LLM model. Um, and we have that natural language searching, and most importantly, we're linking back out to the Scopus abstracts uh, so that people can understand where this information is coming from. What are we doing with Science Direct? So this one is kind of the next um, project that we're working on is how to bring Gen AI into full text search and discovery. Um, and I want to share two experiments. These are sort of mini experiments that are happening within Science Direct right now. Uh, and these are live and in production, but they're kind of hard to find <laughs> because they're, they're, uh, we, we've purposely sort of buried them in the tool because they're not really ready for prime time. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with our uh, topic pages. These are um, machine-generated topic pages that have been around since about 2017 that sort of uh, generate a summary on a given topic. Um, within those topic pages, we we're doing a little experiment with um, Gen AI to automatically generate some questions and answers that might be answered by that topic page um, and, and pull out those, those uh, snippets of information um, when users click on those questions. And I have an example, I have some links in the slide here that you can see if you want to actually look at this for real. And then on the, on the other side of here, we have an experiment, or experiment we're doing with just 20,000 articles, which is like a needle in a haystack in Science Direct, so you're very unlikely to stumble across one of these, um, but they're there, uh, which is kind of pre-generated questions and answers again on the full text article. So this is the idea of, hey, you know, you don't have to read the whole article, you can just say, you know, what, what, what can I learn from this? What are some of the things that this paper answers? Um, and these are just sort of some experiments we're doing to get at what Judd was talking about is, you know, instead of sifting through all this information, can we generate some answers um, on the fly that users might be interested in? Um, and I, I don't have it here on a slide because it's not quite there yet, but we are uh, behind the scenes um, experimenting with the full uh, Science Direct search um, and hopefully we'll be 
doing some user testing soon on that and starting to work with customers on that. I have gotten a sneak preview. It is very cool. I, I wasn't given permission to actually show it right now because the developers were like, it's not quite there yet. So, um, but it's coming soon. Uh, similar to what you see with, with Scopus, but on the full text database. So I want to share a little bit about how we're developing uh, with the research community. We have been doing quite a bit of beta testing, alpha testing just for kind of infrastructure and bandwidth testing with random users. And then we did a bunch of, uh, with Scopus AI, thousands of users were engaged in testing the product. Uh, both people we reached out to proactively, um, but also people who responded to calls for, um, for user testing. There's also a preprint here. Uh, it's not published yet, but it is in preprint form. One of our beta testers wrote a very extensive article about her experience testing with us, which was really great. Um, we didn't ask her to do that, but it's out there and, and really interesting reading. So what are we learning from users uh, of these new tools and these emerging tools? I just want to share a few things that we've learned from our Scopus AI beta testing. Um, one question we had was where, where should this live, right? Is it, should we just put it right front up and center and default search and, and users are like, no, don't do that. Should we bury it somewhere off to the side? No, don't do that. Um, so it's side by side is what users are really appreciating. So Scopus is still there, classic Scopus as we call it, um, and Scopus AI is, is there too on a separate tab. We're learning that users really want to see the papers. Um, they want to see those abstracts. They want them very clearly linked to what the Gen AI is producing. So rather than just a little footnote that you can click on and see what the abstract is, they wanted that sidebar. The paper is right there. You can see any assertion that the LLM makes has to be linked to an actual paper. Um, and the paper is right there where you can see it and link out to it. One of the things users asked when they started to, to test Scopus AI is they said, you could do so much more. Uh, Scopus is known as a citation index where you can really track citation trails and you can find out who's the expert on a given topic. Can the Gen AI help surface some of that information on seminal authors, foundational papers, and topic experts? So we've been starting to uh, build that into the tool. Um, I did a search uh, for this screenshot. I thought, well, okay, theory of relativity. You would hope that the 1905 Einstein paper would come up, and it did. I was so thrilled. I think it's probably got more than 2,000 citations at this point, but, um, you know, it, it is what it is. So this, this functionality is, is still in flux, but it's actually really, really popular with users. Uh, lastly, short summaries. We started with just like sort of a short summary that the Gen AI would produce uh, based on the Scopus uh, search results, and users said, I want to know more. Can, can there be an expanded summary? So we built that into the tool. And lastly, just a call for interest. Um, we are not quite at the point where we're doing testing with libraries and with researchers on the Science Direct, but we are getting ready to do so. So if you're interested in your library or yourself or you know of users who are interested, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Leo for a quick wrap up before we open it up to questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emily and Elias, for sharing. Um, so I'm going to bring it back to cover the bigger picture uh, question, because as we see generative AI being integrated into information discovery, we need to think about the roles of librarians or libraries in the future. I was, I'm part of the, the scenario task force, and that's really one of the big questions, is what's the role of libraries and, and librarians in the future. We don't really have an answer, but what I know is we will need to keep up, uh, hopefully even take on leadership roles you know, in this transition. And this shift underscores the need for continuous learning and the development of new skills. And AI literacy emerges as a crucial competency, and not just for information professionals, but for everybody, really. So, and understanding the, the mechanics, uh, capabilities, limitations of generative AI will be fundamental. 
so I conducted a uh, national uh, study on AI literacy among uh, academic library employees last May. We found only a very modest level of AI literacy among library workers and a real appetite for structured training and professional development opportunities. And in the survey, people paid for premium um, subscriptions of AI tools like GPT-4, uh, which was, by the way, less than 7% of the respondents, had higher levels of AI literacy and confidence in using AI tools, which makes sense, they probably use it more. So, and, and also last uh, CNI meeting in the fall, I share a little bit about my college's GPT-4 exploration program uh, in which we paid for 10 volunteers to use GPT to integrate it into their work, experiment with it, and kind of like a community of practice. And that showed that people really learned from using it and playing with it, experimenting and sharing too. So we're expanding it to people outside of the, the, the libraries, to faculty. So I'll encourage other libraries to do something like that. Um, but I think it takes more than just ad hoc effort in individual organizations. Because when I say AI literacy, we don't really have a definition of what that means. What are, what are the competencies? So therefore, um, as um, president-elect of ACRL, I have just established an AI competency for library workers task force. Um, the charge is to develop a set of comprehensive AI competencies for library, work, library workers that align with the evolving needs of academic libraries in the context of AI integration. Um, just a set of basic standard, standardized competencies for all library workers. So the official call for volunteers will be coming out this week. People in this room, in this conference, will be perfect candidates to work on this. So I encourage you to look into it or share with people you think may be interested in volunteer. We're looking for eight to 10 members, diverse group of library professionals, people who possess specialized knowledge and skills in the field of AI, and just academic stakeholders. Um, so look into that. Um, ACR has also begun a comprehensive review of the information literacy framework and looking to incorporate AI into it. Um, and it's going to be a major task, but we have started already. Um, another thing to share with, uh, consistent with my study was uh, Cynthia uh, hassan Vitali and I conducted two questionnaires with a ARL library directors uh, last year. And same kind of finding in that there is a need for training and there is a need to upskill. So we want to work on that. Um, so to close is that we are seeing a lot more usage of generative AI and um, both for us and for us to maybe take the role in teaching our users how to use it. So I encourage you to uh, uh, work, to get, work on that together. So thank you very much. We'll be happy to answer some questions you have, if you have any or just I would love to hear your thoughts on some of these things and, um, and maybe even share some of the projects you're doing at your place. So thank you very much. Feel free to feel free to come to the um, mics in the in the room. Thank you very much, um, Elias. I was curious: Have you heard anecdotes or talked to people who have been using the tool to see if they've found it to be? useful to them? How are they, and how are they using it exactly in their, their research? Yes, uh, we've done some of that. Um, the, the conference that we hosted back in January, uh, it gave us an opportunity to connect with a number of faculty who were already familiar with the tool. So um, it, it's, that was helpful. But I think uh, at the end of this, this semester, we want to um, invite more uh, active users to give us their feedback because um, it's, it's a new tool, right? And um, we want to know if this, if a second year subscription will make sense or not. 
but I think that's where, yeah, uh, connecting with them will be important. So y yes and no, it's a work in progress. <laughs> and since I'm here, I'm going to ask just one more question. Um, so when I had worked with, not worked with Site, but uh, play with, played with it at, and showed it to some of the faculty that I work with, who were interested in seeing what they could, how they could leverage generative AI to help them um, with their literature reviews. One of the problems that came up very clearly was that Cite was um, citing articles, but the faculty would look at it. He was an expert in this area. And he would say, "No, no, no. That's that is not the original source. So that article that's being cited was citing something else." So that, um, I, I don't know if they've solved that problem yet, and I don't know if um, Scopus AI has potentially that same fundamental problem. So I was wondering what, what you think about that. I, ha I have not heard about uh, an issue like that, uh, but then again, I think uh, being a kind of a new tool, um, I'm sure that they will welcome that type of feedback as well, right? So that they can make those changes um, as they go along. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just weigh in as well about um, citations. And uh, citations are, are a challenge, right? And I think, um, I don't know what the answer is, but I think we're finding with our foundational papers and topic experts feature that, um, uh, you know, I, I tried to get Leo to come up because I consider him an, an expert in like information literacy and AI. And I did actually as, a, as an expert, um, but then when I typed my query a different way, he didn't. <laughs> so, what? I know. And these people came up I'd never heard of. Not, I mean, maybe they are like the top experts, but it's really tricky. Like, because um, just because you're an ex, you, you might be the expert, but maybe you don't have enough citations or, you know, it, citation trails aren't the be all end all of understanding and mapping a discipline. So I think we need better ways to do that. And I'm not sure what the answer is, but it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Your answer right now, Emily, was a good lead answer. So Lisa Hinchliffe, University of Illinois, I've gotten the opportunity to experiment with both the alpha and beta of the Scopus AI. Um, and I'm wondering, one of the things that it seems to me is actually not possible, and surprisingly so, is to actually ask about someone's research. You can ask about a topic, right. but Scopus is sitting there with all this authorship data, which is connected to topic data, and so the only, you get this weird thing if somebody tries to ask about who, like you just said, who are the experts in this area? You get if this person has been talked about as an expert, not like, but you can't just say like, oh, and I'll just say, like, what does Lisa Hinchliffe work on? Right. Which just strikes me as such an odd omission. So I'm wondering if you know why that's omitted. Um, you know, is it something to do with the way the metadata structures are? What, what's going on there? Because this just seems to me like such an obvious, especially for Scopus, maybe less for Science yes. Direct. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's like if, if I went to your author Scopus page, I'd get a nice list of your publications, right? <laughs> so, and I, honestly, I think that's, there are still some, some areas that haven't been developed in the tool, and that's such an obvious one. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing users do that back and forth thing. I was uh, doing a workshop with a group of librarians the other day and they were like, oh, I tried it in classic and I got this and then I tried it in you know, Gen AI and I got that. And so there are definitely some missing functionalities in the Scopus AI um, that we still need to think through and build out. In terms of the reason for that, we are using an LLM, right? And an LLM is about language and semantic understanding, right? So if, if, if I type the question in a way that semantically gets at, um, you know, who's the expert, it might work better, but, you know, it, 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 can't, it can't do what classic Scopus can do, which is just give me that list of publications right up and right front and center. So it's interesting what the shortcomings are when you try and 
kind of shoehorn these, these more traditional functions into an LLM environment. Um, so some, definitely some more thinking needs to be done there to, to bring the full functionality of Scopus into Scopus AI, if that makes sense. Um, why don't we go to this mic, maybe? Oh, he was here before. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not keeping track. So go ahead, Scott. Thank you, Emily. A uh, question for Leo. In terms of your uh, surveying with ARL library directors, so over the years, and there are more of them behind me than in front of me, um, I've been the first person to hire a head of instruction at an ARL library, the first person to hire an instructional design librarian at an ARL library, the first person to hire an assessment librarian. And we, you know, we have this cycle of adopting new skills and expertise into, uh, into the libraries. What are you seeing at this point? We're talking about professional development, which of course would be broadly distributed across librarians. What are you seeing in terms of the state of play of people creating those specialist roles or those lead librarians the way we have successively done over the last 30 years in different areas? Yeah, so it, I think it's happening, but um, not, I, there's some early adopters that are, and also places with more resources that are doing that. Um, I think that's the key thing is resources. I, can, I mean, this is being recorded, so I need to be careful. But we don't have that kind of resources that some really big, you know, universities can have that can do cluster hires and create positions. So we have to be creative. For example, the one reason I focus on AI literacy, especially at my place, is because it doesn't cost as much money to do. And, and it's a needed, it's essential first step. So that's kind of my kind of recommendation to places like mine, where we cannot just hire a bunch of AI specialists, work on that kind of basic skill set first, because that's all kind of needed with you know, the entire organization. So, and we can take a leadership role there. So that's that. But I am seeing some places, and I'm, I know some places have already kind of you know, sent out or um, created positions that are very AI specific and good for them, and we can learn from them and work with them, hopefully, as well, so. All right, one last question I think we have time for. Good morning, Gunter Weibel, California Digital Library. Um, my question is about incentives and business models, and I think it's mainly for you, Emily. And I'm thinking about uh, a couple of things here. I'm thinking that the emergence of AI has now really given a new appreciation of the value of the corpus publishers have amassed over the centuries in some instances. Uh, so this corpus is now valued in a different way and it's literally worth more in terms of dollars because it can potentially be resold to those who are creating AI models. And if that's a good theory to have, and I think it is a good theory to have, then I'm wondering about the relationship changes that it'll introduce between publishers and libraries, particularly along two dimensions. One is the publishing dimensions, where a lot of libraries are interested in open access publishing for their authors. And of course, once an author has published open access, that article is available under a Creative Commons license, and anyone can include it in uh, their AI model, so it's, it's no longer a, a marketable good in the same way that an article is that's published subscription. So that seems to introduce new incentives and dynamics. And then on the reading dimension, I think there are new incentives and dynamics as well in that we're seeing publishers wanting to introduce clauses into library licenses that would prohibit our um, our users from text and data mining, which they've always done, and now also from AI research directly. And so those are, those, are, those are new areas we're feeling into, and I wonder whether you can comment how you see the dynamics develop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gunter. There's, that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a lot wrapped up in that question. We could, we could go on for hours. Um, but just to touch on a, a couple of points there, um, I, I do think that um, this, is a, this is a quickly evolving area and we're all sort of starting to try and figure it out. Um, but I think with the, 
with the our biggest concern at Elsevier right now is we want to make sure that the scholarly record doesn't get polluted by um, the the models ingesting the scholarly corpus and then scholars using um, maybe less trustworthy tools to answer their research questions and not knowing where that information comes from, right? So if, if the LLMs are ingesting all of this, all of these papers and people are going directly to those models to answer their research questions, they don't get to see the paper, right? So we are very concerned at Elsevier that our papers and the, the, the research that's done by our authors doesn't get ingested into these models as training data, right? And that's really what's behind those clauses uh, that you're mentioning in terms of the, the AI licensing. Um, so, so that's one of the big concerns we have is we want to make sure that that content isn't used as training data, right? That we want to make sure that researchers understand where that content came from. They can still get back to the original paper. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's in terms of, um, you know, the, the reading side, I think there's a lot of potential here to accelerate knowledge, to, to uh, make sure that um, our, our readers can access information in, in uh, more efficient ways, right? So I think there's a lot of potential here, but there's also a lot of risk, and we are concerned about that as a business in terms of making sure that Scholarly databases are still a go-to place for our researchers, um, and, and so we do have concerns around that. Great. Thank you very much. We're at time, so thank you for coming. <laughs>